Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this presentation talking about virtual reality, some of the options that we have for different ways that you might be able to get yourself into that world without spending, you know, caches and caches of money. So as we're looking at all of this, we've got a couple different perspectives and opinions that will be thrown into this. My name is Joe. I can see I'm the director of the Building Lifecycle Solutions team here at Imaginative Technologies, uh, to some extent playing the part of the, the overseer and kind of directing things as we're going along through the conversation. People with the real knowledge that we'll be wanting to talk to are going to be Vince and Marie. Uh, Vince. Thanks, Joe. My name's Vince Danielli. I'm a uh, Building Solutions Division Team Manager here at Imagine It and also lead our Twin Motion team, uh, which were the expert visualization folks. So, um, really, all things related to virtual reality. And my part of this presentation is going to really highlight. Uh, twin motion and some other options for some quick ways to get to VR without breaking the bank. Marie? And I am Marie williams -Bell. I am an applications expert on Vince's team. Um, my part of this presentation is going to be talking about the possibilities for virtual reality within Revit. <clears throat> so why immersive visualization? Uh, the benefits of immersive visualization are pretty straightforward. Um, and they help you to clearly understand the space, visually analyze environmental impact, and promote enthusiasm throughout the project with your customers and team members. Yeah, and, and as we're looking at that, when we're we're thinking about the the idea of immersing people in environments to be able to describe and understand what's going on, some of the things we've got to think about through there is you know what's the cost of this communication? We've been doing renderings and maybe some level of animations for for years now, and all of the things that applied to still renderings and you know fixed path animations still apply here there's things that we'll have to consider about do you want to try and have something be completely photorealistic or do you want to uh, make it a little bit more generic so people aren't saying that's not the color of green i was expecting uh, so there's there's this time and and planning that has to go along with it but when we move into the vr side we get this extra piece that comes around and says well how do we how do we present this how do we understand the the cost that's going to go with you know hardware to be able to see this what type of hardware are we going to go through and we'll talk about some of those things as well and so as we're going into this vr world there's places where you've got to be aware of the possibility of additional hard costs that are coming out of this in you know we'll call headsets tablets or whatever uh, there's going to be an option that we need to be paying attention to for the soft cost of how much time is it going to take for you to be able to plan these things and put it into place now, our concept that we have here as we're talking about things is how could we go about moving our way into this virtual environment without breaking the bank, without spending thousands and thousands of dollars on super high-end equipment? Now, that being said, we have to keep in mind that there's going to be a, a, a linear threshold through here. Of if we're not breaking the bank, we might not get quite the same quality as if you were going to go break the bank to get something going on through here. So we need to keep that that spectrum of things in mind. And as you're doing that, the key part to it all ends up being really the last question here of what is your visualization goal? Are you trying to communicate an idea of the space and make it an immersive experience for somebody to understand how it'll feel to be in the space? Or are you trying to get something that's really super high end, uh, just photo real environment that you're going through? If you're going for that photo real side, well, maybe you've got to go a little bit more towards spending for some of these things than the not breaking the bank that part that we're talking about here. So it's gonna be a cost range. We'll talk about some of the specific things in there. And one of them being the idea of how are you gonna view those items? So if we're viewing this virtual environment, and we're probably seeing saying some things here that everybody's been aware of for some extent for now, we have different ways that you can view a virtual environment on a mobile device, on your telephones, on your tablets, um, any number of different types of things through there. If you go ahead and walk there, yeah. The, there's options where you can get to a virtual environment through the web and be able to see that maybe through your computer to be able to go through it in a, in a gaming type environment. When we're looking at that from a viewing option, it's probably safe to say that inside your organization, people that need to do something with VR have a phone. Uh, some or all of them might have a tablet that you could use to view these things, whether we're talking about virtual or augmented reality. Everybody's got a computer. Now, they might not be worth 
uh, doing a serious virtual environment with like the, the laptop I use here has integrated video. Uh, I know that myself and Vince Murray kind of joke and yeah, it's it's not the best thing in the world for being able to get through and actually show something worthwhile in a in a smooth environment. But there's some cool things that we can do these days with streaming information from the web where it's not using my onboard video for that and can make it a little bit better. Then we'll have the idea of, of headsets. So when we're talking about headsets, there's been a recent piece of, gosh, what we had a uh, Christmas time, my family got me a uh, Oculus Quest 2. Um, $300 for those types of things. When we're talking about not breaking the bank, $300 is a lot better than you know thousand or multiple thousands of dollars in setup and space to go through things. Uh, there's possibilities with some of the, the beta pieces that have come around with that particular headset where you can connect it wirelessly to a computer. Now that computer does need to have a decent video card, so I'm not gonna do that to my laptop, but we can connect it to a computer. We can say, yes, allow this to uh, connect and work with some of the non-Oculus applications like say a Revit or a Twin Motion and be able to have a relatively inexpensive piece of hardware working with your systems again not breaking the bank is it going to be ideal again if you're going to be spending 1200 or more dollars on on some sort of an immersive set setup it's going to be better if you spend a little bit more money and get a high-end uh, usb-c cable to connect the headset to your computer it's going to be better but there's possibilities that exist in a number of different ways to be able to make it doable is going to be the, the word that we'll throw through there. It's, it's something that can be done. So there are some options of what we've got for viewing, some of the things we can do for, for seeing what's going on. Uh, maybe take a look at what do we do to get, get the scene to exist as at all. And we throw that back to you, I believe, Marie. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about virtual, virtual reality with Reddit. So for the project that we used for this presentation, <clears throat> uh, we have included two different design options. So you can see here, there's different layouts in both of these different uh, these plans. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a 3D view. I've already got one created. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I get the rendering settings set up the way I want. I'm gonna make sure that I've got the interior sun and artificial lighting, just like you would when you're in Revit. Um, I'm gonna set my background style. <clears throat> and make sure that everything looks the way I want it to so I can just get this one right. Once I'm done with that, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this view and create another one for the other design option. Yep, so just gonna duplicate it. <clears throat> just give it a second. So now I have my two 3D views that I'm both gonna send to the cloud once I get these set up. So <clears throat> I'm setting this one to be for the design option number two. And I'm going to set this one, try to close out of some of these views so I can see exactly what's going on. <clears throat> and I'm just going to make sure that the right design option is set in the visibility graphics settings of each of these before I send it to render. Make sure I get the right one. There we go. Double checking the other one. All right, make sure this one's set to the other one. There we go. <clears throat> and then through the view tab, you'll notice up in the top corner, <clears throat> we have rendering cloud. So I'm just going to click on rendering cloud. And I'm going to use the drop down menu to select both of my views so I can send them both at once. I no longer have to render just one at a time. I can do them both. I'm going to set my output type to panorama. And I'm going to go ahead and set my render, render quality to final. Once it's done generating how many credits I need, I'm going to say I want to send an, uh, an email to me when it's complete, and I'm going to send it up into the cloud to render. So one of the great benefits of this is I can continue working on the Revit model while that's rendering in the cloud. So now that that's been rendered in the cloud, I can go to my cloud gallery, and I can take a look at this rendering that I've created. <clears throat> because I use the panoramic view, I can actually view from the point of my camera. I can actually look around from the view, kind of getting a much more immersive experience than I would if I was doing like a static rendering. I can look all around me, I can see what's going on, check everything out. <clears throat> and then when I'm ready, 
get my view set just so I can actually see when the change is made. I'm going to go look at the other design option now and see which one I like better. So it's going to maintain that camera view. So I'm actually looking at the same point when I switch to the other rendering, but now I can actually look around in this other rendering as well. So I get to see both of my design options in a much more immersive, uh, interactive experience. So there are some pros and cons of rendering with Revit. Um, pros being that there's a very low cost. Um, you can continue working while your rendering is being processed. And it's easy to test renderings. You can do like lower quality renderings quickly and test them before you do your final renderings. It's very easy to share an interactive interactive rendering with a customer or a client. And all you have to do is just share it with them, send them a link. And it's very user friendly. If you've ever rendered in Revit, then you can you can do this very easily. Some of the cons are that the quality of the rendering isn't quite as high as we would normally like. Um, there's no live updates between Revit and the cloud. You have to deliberately send those updates to the cloud when you're ready to render. And the processing time is a little bit longer. Cool. I will pick it up from here. Thanks, Marie. Uh, one thing I do want to point out too, when you're rendering out of Revit and pushing it to the cloud, um, when you when you go to push that out, you have the two options of panorama and then a stereo panorama. So uh, we talked about the cheap peripherals that can be used for viewing virtual reality. And one of those is a stereoscopic viewer like a Google Cardboard. So you can actually generate a QR code from the Autodesk cloud where your renderings are hosted and share that out with customers. And then if they're using a, a mobile phone, they can just scan that QR code and it will link that stereo pano um, to their mobile device. They can put it in the Google Cardboard and view it. So um, it is sort of a, a very quick, cheap way to get to an immersive experience without um, having to be in front of a desktop computer. All right, so I'm going to show uh, I'm going to show how we can use that Revit model and push it into uh, Twin Motion for immersive experience. Whoops, sorry, back up a second. When I um, start playing it, when I go, um, I'll talk about the direct link. So I'll kind of tee it up to the whole direct link in the settings, and then then hit the play button. Okay. okay. Cool. Can you back up the other slide? It'll just help us to clip it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. All right. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so you want to go to the next one now? Yep. All right. So now I'm going to show you how to take that same Revit model that Marie was working in in Revit, push it into Twin Motion to create an immersive experience. Now, a couple of things I'll mention here about um, just the way that a lot of these applications like Twinmotion, um, Lumion's another one, the way that they work is we're, we're still dependent on these design modeling programs, or design authoring programs. So yes, we can build the context or better context around our building and in the building uh, using these real-time rendering machines like Twinmotion, but we still are dependent on using programs like Revit or SketchUp in order to create our 3D designs and push them into these programs. So we're not eliminating Revit out of the workflow in this case, but it's still a much easier way to, and it gives better results um, using programs like Twinmotion. And I'll talk about the benefits here. So one great thing about Twinmotion is that it does have a plugin for Revit that allows us to create a direct link between um, between Revit and push it into Twin Motion. So some of the settings here I'll point out. Let me uh, just navigate really quickly to that same view that we're using. So, okay, so here's a 3D view. Um, we want to start in a 3D view, and then I'll just point out some settings here. So when we do start with Twin Motion, we have the option of how we want our materials to merge or not merge. I prefer not merging the materials, um, and we can translate them to Twin Motion using either the direct link, which is the little I button, or we can export it. So I kind of preset this up. When I export this into Twin Motion, uh, we're live in that same area that Marie was in. But what's great is we can really walk around. And this is all rendering in real time. 
Um, one thing I noticed here is I had some a duplicate column, so I just turned it off in the scene graph into in motion, look around, move around through the space. Um, and one of the first things I'm going to show here is how we can adjust and make our materials more realistic. So just as an example, I'm going to pick the wall here and show you that it does translate the material from Revit. We can change the color of that material, but notice all of the walls are changing. And it's really quick and easy to adjust color. But if we don't want all of the walls to change, we can pick a material from the Twin Motion Library. In this case, I'll just grab a matte wall type and apply it um, to the surface. Now, the way that we apply materials, we can either replace the entire Revit material all at once. So changing the color, it's not going to really show us much of a difference um, in this view. But if I just want to replace the material on this individual wall, we could change the selection method, pick a different color, and you'll notice that we do have control over those individual elements. And that's really based on the way that I brought this in initially um, with no merge. I'm going to pick the uh, ductwork here because it all comes in kind of looking a little crummy. And again, into a motion, just choose one of the out of the box materials that come with the program. Galvanize steel, drag and drop it. So I'm still in that only replace one object, switch back to replace all of the ductwork. And voila, it replaces all of the sheet metal, all of the ductwork. One thing that happened though, and I can kind of see this in the background as I change the reflection, that wall in the back must have had the same generic material as the ductwork, and that's no good. So again, just in the way that we're applying materials, I'm gonna choose a different matte wall material here. Um, scroll down. So I'll make this shiny paint, make sure I switch back to just apply that material to that wall, and then adjust the color. And you can see just that wall changes. So it's nice because it, it isn't solely dependent on the materials that we place in Revit. We do have that element to element adjustability um, to customize materials and colors. And Twinmotion does have some really nice out of the box materials. So next, I'm gonna show uh, how we can replace objects. Now this is a direct link. So this gym equipment is static. We do have gym equipment from Twinmotion out of the box. Uh, and it looks much more realistic, so definitely an advantage here. And I think this one is a rear yeah, lat raise, or no, it's a, which one is it? Let me scroll down here. Um, the rear delt fly, I think, is this machine. So I'm just going to hide it from the scene graph and drop in that more realistic looking machine. So it's great because these assets are built into Twinmotion, but we can expand and add to the library with more realistic objects. Uh, that would be very, very difficult to model up in Revit to make it look that good. Uh, so just adding some more context, another great thing that Twinmotion does have is we can replace objects kind of globally. So we might have all this different equipment that we're trying to globally replace. We just drag and drop it into uh, replace and click that play button. Now I did this as a direct link. We would have to do an import for that to work uh, to replace our objects, but if you're using an import instead of a direct link, that's a nice option there. So next, I'm just gonna drop in some people. So Twinmotion does come pre-stocked with static people that are going to uh, be animated. And they have a lot more options in the posed people than the animated. So I'm just placing a couple of uh, folks in here in workout clothes. And as you can see, you're going to get a much more realistic uh, character than you would from maybe a Revit RPC, you know, those little flat cardboard types of people. I'll put a running lady here on the uh, treadmill. So all I'm really doing here is trying to make it more realistic and create the context of uh, people in the space. Um, just adding realism improves that immersive experience. And then finally, beyond just the static people, we can also add animated people. Uh, there aren't any animated people in workout clothes out of the box. So let's put this lady over here on her phone. 
And what's nice about these assets is that they do have parameters that you can change the color of their clothes, their position. So going from uh, idle position, sitting, you can even do dancing, which is kind of fun. And in each of these different positions or poses, there are additional animation options that you can choose. So even within the different poses, you have uh, variations of how you want that idle person to move. So this all comes stock with twin motion. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this at the end, but what you get from twin motion, you know, you can create this more immersive environment. You can move around the environment. Looking outside here, we can do things like change the time of the day really quickly and see the impact that it has on our model. So just adjusting the current daylight, we can see how the shadows from that curtain wall come in. Um, what we can also do, so whoops, let me go into uh, my settings here. We can change the location. So we can set a geolocation. We can adjust the north offset, which impacts the uh, direction of the sun. And we can also put in a different background for the environment. So I changed it from a cityscape to a mountain landscape. Um, and then also you can see when you do bring this into twin motion, it's kind of just sitting on a pedestal in space. Um, in twin motion, we can bring in a landscape. So I'll just drag one in that's kind of more in context with mountains, this rocky grasslands, and it's going to drop in a uh, terrain. You can import terrain from other programs like InfraWorks or Topo um, files. So it doesn't have to be this sort of generic landscape. But just some other things that we can do to create and communicate context you know, in this environment, just adding trees individually, dragging and dropping them. And you can see that they're much more realistic than the RPC trees that you get from Revit. We also have the ability to paint vegetation. And this is one of my favorite features. We can grab some of those stock trees from our library and then using a paintbrush, actually start to paint a forest out. So instead of individually placing, and I could increase the diameter and really um, paint a lot of trees at once. I'm not going to do that because it could break my computer right now during the presentation. Um, so uh, getting into the environment, just showing you here that we can also adjust weather settings and you'll see how that um, impacts the, the landscape. We've got rain and puddling. We can also change the season, which is pretty cool. So we can go from you know, summertime to fall to winter, and you see those particles. All of this stuff will show when you get into VR as well, depending on how you set it up in the twin motion scene. Oops. Pause recording here for a sec. Back up. All right. So getting back to summer, just want to show that you can also, this is a cool feature in twin motion, we could show vegetation growth globally, and then um, just like to also point out when you do change the weather you get those clouds so it's not just a clear sky we can create smog and fog in the environment so all of these different things that revit doesn't allow us to do we can really really quickly build the context and communicate a more realistic uh, scene in twin motion one of the last things i'll show here is we can also animate character paths so i mentioned before that we're not um, modeling inside of twin motion but we're building context and all of these little tools like character path animation super intuitive and easy to do this stuff um, they are based on a set of different rules so we create our path we can change the type of clothes these people are wearing the direction that they're moving we can widen their uh, their path so there's a crowd of people sorry I'm zooming around here I'm trying not to make anyone sick and some of the other assets that we can replace uh, you can swap out doors so some of the basic stuff to make the environments a bit more interactive um, i would have to turn that off and, and swap it out with one of the twin motion doors but let me just kind of teleport back up to the original floor that marie set up and um, to just kind of finish the demonstration in twin motion i'll show you how easy it is to once you've got the, the scene set up, so I know I just did this really briefly, 
Obviously, you would take more time to add better materials and better context. But when you're ready, all you have to do is click this button to VR. And if you have a supported headset plugged into your computer, it will take this scene and it'll put it into an immersive VR experience. One of the final things we can do is push this to the cloud. So this is with Twinmotion 2021. And I'll actually pause here because it's going to take a while to process the scene. But one of the options we have for the cloud presenters, we can share that out to people like Joe with uh, a bad computer and he can view the, uh, the whole scene through the web. Um, some of the other output that we have, we can create panoramas like Marie showed. So just from a static position in the model, if we want to create, so I'm just gonna move back to where Marie created her 360 view. If we wanna create one that maybe looks a, a bit better than what we get from Revit, we can create that panel and export it. And some of the options that we have then when we set the panorama view, we can turn on the three, 3D mode. So if you have 3D glasses, you, know, you can look at an image um, in a stereoscopic viewer or on a screen. But all you have to do is export this and it creates this kind of flattened out um, 3D image for the panorama. So yeah, um, some of the pros and cons about virtual reality with twin motion. Obviously a pro with using twin motion and it is based on the Unreal Engine, which I'll talk about in a second, but that is a real time rendering program, which allows us to do one click to VR as shown in the, uh, the demo, you get higher quality assets. So some of the people that I placed in the scene are going to look a lot better than your stock people from Revit or even really advanced um, assets that you can put into Revit. Uh, we can do animated objects in twin motion, like the character paths or just the animated people. Um, we can animate cars, vehicles, animals even. We can also develop project phasing. So if you're trying to show something like a construction timeline, there is a phasing area in Twin Motion where we can create uh, uh, a phasing timeline and have things showing and disappearing through the construction phases. And one of the best things I think is, yes, this is a, um, a budget-friendly solution, Twin Motion is, but it's also a very user-friendly solution. It doesn't take much to get into the program and learn a lot of those higher end um, material controls and uh, you know, placing people and building the context. So the learning curve in Twin Motion uh, is a very quick learning curve. Now, the cons to Twin Motion is that we do have limited control over custom settings. Uh, we can do a lot with materials, but we can't do all of the things with materials that you might be able to do in, let's say, the Unreal Engine or 3ds Max to create uh, very customized materials with different supporting maps. Twin Motion does require higher end graphics cards and hardware, so there's definitely a cost that gets associated with using Twin Motion, um, an investment in better hardware. And one of the other um, cons is that. Twinmotion does have a lot of great little interact interactions that we can build in. Like as you approach a door, it'll swing open, or we can animate certain things to um, to move and basically slide along paths. But outside of that, the interactivity into Twinmotion and the customization of that interactivity is pretty limited. Um, so next slide, Murray. So I just want to talk about some of the other options that are out there. You know, the purpose of this presentation is to present ways that we can get into immersive VR without breaking the bank. And these other options, and probably many of you already have access to 3ds Max through the AEC collection. So a lot of the stuff that Marie was showing in Revit um, in rendering to the cloud, we have the ability to do that through 3ds Max as well. So we can model everything up in Revit, we can push it to 3ds Max. If you have people on your team that are a little bit more advanced in materials and lighting and, and good with 3ds Max, they can do those cloud renderings um, from 3ds Max and create those panoramas and maybe look a lot better than what you're getting from just the, uh, the Revit materials and the Revit lighting. Um, and also we can kind of use 3ds Max as the the middleman between some of these gaming engines. So we can build uh, 
uh, more detailed assets and, and 3D objects in 3ds Max, but it's still sort of that the idea of it being a model authoring software. You're not going to get a, a one button to VR uh, capability in 3ds Max. And obviously, as Joe mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, you know, the soft cost of someone learning 3ds Max and, and being good with materials uh, that increases your timeline. There's a lot more work involved in setting up that realism and pushing it into the gaming engine. So uh, it's not always the most cost effective way to VR. And then finally, we do have gaming engines. And essentially, and realistically, the, uh, the gaming engines with the Unreal Engine specifically, there is really no cost associated to it until you hit a certain level of uh, a royalty. I think it's like a million dollars where you have to actually start to pay for the Unreal Engine. So if you're using it just to set up uh, immersive scenes for presentation purposes, you're not directly making any money off of that. It's not like you're you're selling that to someone um, and they're paying a cost. So there's really no royalty that will kick in. However, with the gaming engine, uh, there is a very steep learning curve. And most of the time, if you're looking to get a customized immersive experience in like the Unreal Engine or Unity, there are specific companies that specialize in that. And you're probably more apt to outsource it than to try to do that in-house unless you want to hire a gaming developer on staff. The advantage of the gaming engines is that you do have more ability to customize and create a different interaction within your VR experience. So really the sky is the limit. You can you can pick up objects, you can um, move things around on the fly, you can create your own user interface within the gaming engines, but you know the timeline for developing something like that is extremely long and the workflows are difficult. So in a nutshell, um, I think that's pretty much my piece. Cool. So I guess as we're getting into this, the final thoughts, when we're looking at that spectrum of possibilities, we've got everything from uh, hit the render button in, in Revit and view things on on your mobile device, on the computer. Google Cardboard is darn cheap. Uh, thanks for bringing that one up, Vince. Uh, taking it up a little bit from there is getting something like the Quest 2 or, or something to, to be a little bit more immersive and being immersive. There's... You know, I was surprised by how much of a difference it made to strap something onto my head and look around in a scene versus watching it on a on a flat computer. There's something to be said for that. And I'm not sure about the psychology behind it, but it's real. Uh, taking it to the next level from there, um, small, it, I don't have the pricing, you can check with us and get it, but you know, smaller investment to get something else like a, like a twin motion uh, add-in or additional software to help bolster it the design and the presentation of that design a little bit more, uh, going a little bit further to more immense or immersive headsets that can handle a better quality, going a little bit further than that and just things like 3D Studio Max and the, the, the raw gaming engines themselves. So there's an entire spectrum through there, hopefully through everything that we've got. This is a good idea of what types of possibilities exist from the, I've, I've got a budget of zero, and <laughs> let's take something and make that happen to, you know, as, as Vince mentioned, sky's the limit if you take it into that full-on gaming engine. You can do anything you darn well please. But hopefully you found that worthwhile and interesting. And I guess, um, Marie, then Vince, any final thoughts from your side before we close this out? Uh, I thought that Vince's portion of this presentation was awesome. That was, that was really interesting. And I liked that it was, you know, it was a step beyond what you can do in Revit. Um, final thoughts for me would really be, you know, Revit rendering in the cloud is a really just like a quick way to kind of do like a space analysis or just check out what's going on um, it very easily just through Revit through like, you know, the skills that you probably already have as a Revit user. Yeah, and I feel like um, with our customers and ones we've worked with, they're more interested in, in getting that sort of that gateway presentation to the immersive experience. So whether it is through Revit and cloud rendering, um, knowing that that's out there and, and knowing the appropriate ways to use it and, and who your target audience is and what they're getting from that visualization is really the most important thing to deciding how much you want to invest in this technology. And one other thing that I, we always have to consider is the, 
the rate that the, the hardware is improving and you know the investment that you make today, uh, it could be less expensive in the future for a different type of headset or, or a different way to, uh, to get to that. But it's a decision that you know, our customers are faced with. Do they, want to, do they want to invest thousands of dollars into a hardware at this moment? Um, and they might not have staff to support all of these more complicated workflows. Or do you just want to kind of you know, get into this sort of the easier VR, see how you can use that and present it to uh, stakeholders and projects? And maybe that will lead you then to invest in a more, uh, more expensive solution. You see the reactions that um, your customers are getting or stakeholders are, are giving you. And then um, I guess eventually maybe it does make sense to invest in the higher end and, and hire someone on to do the gaming development. Um, but I think the first step, and this is what I like to communicate to a lot of uh, our customers that we have these conversations with, get in there and check this stuff out first. Um, you don't have to go to the, you, know, you don't have to buy the Ferrari. You can you can buy the Corvette first, you know. Um, but yeah, that's uh, basically my my final thoughts, and I, I hope there are some uh, questions here that we can help answer. Cool. Know what you need to do. So thanks again, everybody, very much. Appreciate your time, and look forward to engaging with you through this and answering any questions that you might have.